So I am continuing in the line of the previous two talks. And this time I'm gonna try and talk a little bit about how can we improve the air quality in the indoor environment. And to remind that basically for that, we have three strategies. First of all, source control, ventilation, and air cleaning devices. Now, although this talk is gonna focus on the third aspect, it is important for me to start by saying that air cleaning devices are not a substitute for ventilation. They should not be used as an excuse to reduce ventilation. So this can be something to address in cases where, where we're dealing with areas that are poorly ventilated, or we are limited in ventilation because, because of outdoor air quality, et cetera. And with that said, and following the previous talks, just what are the target uh, indoor pollutants that we need to deal with? So we have the particulate phase, and that can be biological aspect, like the bioaerosols or non-biological materials. And we have also gases, pollutants, and as Charlie and David already mentioned, in the indoor environment, we are mainly talking about VOCs. Now, with regard to the particulate phase, here the approach mainly most, what you're gonna see in a few minutes, most of the treatments are focusing on removing the particles from the airborne to uh, collecting surfaces. For the bioaerosols and the gases VOCs, in addition to removal, we also want to focus on chemical degradation or uh, inactivation of the biological uh, pathogens. Now, since life is complicated, usually what we have is a combination of everything. We have combination of pollutant. It, they can be pathogens with other um, a biological a particulate matter with organic, uh, volatile organic compounds. So the mixture of particulate and gaseous pollutants, biological and non-biological pollutants, all of that makes the decontamination process much more complicated and challenging. And that's the reality we need to face. Now, before diving into the details, uh, the two major approaches we have for all the cleaning devices are, one are the enclosed systems in which we are withdrawing air from the room into the instrument, applying the technology uh, to treat it, and then releasing back to the room the treated air, hopefully the cleaned air. The other approach is the open, uh, the open systems in which we are using the room itself as the space, the space where the technology interacts with the pollutant. So we can release radiation or some uh, treatment agent into the room and that's where the action happens. Now, it is important to mention that both approaches are unlikely to be effective to mitigate short range transport, like person to person transmission. Okay, and with that said, also I'm adding here just one side comment that we need to remember that beyond a certain space between the people, we are also the air that we are inhaling is highly diluted by the surrounding air. So if we are capable of cleaning the surrounding room air, then we are also improving the quality of the inhaled air. Now, with the regard to the technologies, um, uh, the common technologies to treat those three categories of pollutants, uh, here I'm just you know, marking the main technologies for the particulate matter, whether it's in general PM or bioaerosols, we're gonna see filtration, ionizers, electrostatic precipitators. For VOCs, we can have sorption uh, on a sorbing media that will be just the removal from the air uh, from the indoor air. But to actually uh, decontaminate them or actually degrade them, then we are talking when dealing with bioaerosols or VOCs, we're talking about using irradiation, mainly it's gonna be UV radiation or oxidation, chemical, photochemical, uh, oxidation of the pollutants, as well as using plasma cleaners. So my goal now is to actually dive and give, you know, slight uh, principle about each one of these, or actually not all of them, almost all of them. So with filtration, this is the most common and simplest uh, uh, technology for uh, treating uh, air pollution. It, 
of course, focuses mainly on the particulate phase. And as you can see here in this figure that present the collection efficiency as a function of particle size, filtration actually involves several processes. It can go from the diffusion to impaction in, uh, interceptions, etc. I'm not diving into the details, but as a result of the fact that it combines different processes, we are getting actually the most challenging region or the most challenging size category of aerosols to collect by filtration is usually around the 0.2.3 microns. That's like the, the fraction that lies in between the high efficiency of diffusion and the higher efficiency of impaction and interception. And this size category is actually relevant for some of the bioaerosols that we are concerned with. So the, the whole world of filters are usually divided according to their efficiency in, in removing particulate matters. I'm not getting into the details. This is just the tip of the iceberg. But in general, you can see that the most common and popular filters are the ones that provide the lower efficiency, whereas the high-grade filter are much more expensive, but they can give us a very good removal. For example, the HEPA filter are defining beyond 99.95 or 97% uh, removal at the 0.3 microns. And we also have various types of uh, materials used for aerosol and for filters, and that will affect the removal efficiency. So in general, filtration are usually the relatively simpler devices. The high-grade filters can give a effective removal of fine and ultrafine aerosols, including the bioaerosols. But nevertheless, we need to remember that filtration mainly provides PM removal from the air with limited inhibition uh, ability for uh, airborne uh, microorganisms. One of the main challenges with filtration is the high pressure drop on the system, the high air resistance and the clogging with time of the filters that increases the energy demand for these systems and the maintenance required. And improper maintenance may result in new hazards, okay, like filter colonization and chemical formation of chemical byproducts on the filters. The next two technologies are actual filterless technologies. And the idea here is uh, that we are using electrostatic charge uh, to charge the aerosols in the coming air. So this one is the electrostatic precipitator. The air is coming in, passing through a, a net of electrodes. The particles in the air are gaining electrostatic charge. And then downstream, they are being deposited on plates that, are, that have an opposite charge. So we are removing the particles and the outgoing air is free, formally free of particles. This technology has been developed and been widely used in the industry. In recent years, we also see smaller size instruments also for consumer product, eh, for uh, uh, indoor applications. Never that, we need to remember that the efficiency, while these are relatively efficient uh, technologies for PM removal, they depend, their performance depends on the electrical resistivity of the aerosols, the particle size distribution, they provide over, sorry, they provide overall good efficiency, less than the HAPA filters, but the main problem that may occur with these technology is the formation of ozone and NOx due to the corona discharge, the high electric field that we have here. Another technology that also imply electrical field to remove the aerosols is the use of ionizers. And here, unlike the electroprecipitator that I mentioned before, we are not charging the aerosols inside the instrument. Actually, these instruments that are becoming much more popular are charging air molecules and generating ions that are being released to the room air. In the room air, these ions interact with the particulate matter, pass the charge and enhance their uh, coagulation and the deposition of this particles to the surfaces available indoors. Uh, there are many studies showing that there is ion-induced enhancement for aerosol removal, both biological and non-biological aerosols. 
Nevertheless, the removal efficiency is affected by the distance from the source of the ions, the size and the type of the particles. There are evidence for, in addition to enhanced removal of the particles, that we also yield inactivation of the bioaerosols. Uh, there are still uncertainties in this field. Also, the mechanism itself is not clear of how it happens. So definitely there is much more space here for research. Uh, but overall, this technology provides a tool that is relatively requiring less, uh, it's not a high power demand, low maintenance, relatively quiet. But always there is a second side to the coin, the disadvantages, we are removing the aerosols to the surfaces available. So if we are not also resulting in cleaning of these surfaces, we can get actually transfer of the problem from the airborne to the surfaces yielding surface contamination. And in addition, because we have here the involvement of high electrical field, we can also have potential ozone production. And that brings me just one side question is, what is the big deal? of indoor ozone emissions, because as the previous speakers already mentioned, indoor levels of ozone are much lower than the outdoor levels. And that is because the ozone is coming mainly from the outside, that's one thing. But the second thing is that we have many compounds and surfaces in the indoor environment that interact and react with this ozone. And as Charlie already said, much of the indoor air chemistry is initiated by ozone. And the result of that chemistry is production of gases oxidation products and ultrafine aerosols that can pose additional health threat. So in general, if now we are adding an indoor source of ozone, we're going to increase the production rate and the concentration of these oxidation products. And in addition, if we also assume that because we added this air cleaning device, we can reduce the air exchange rate, we are increasing this problem even more because we are not removing these products from the air. So definitely that's an issue that needs to be considered. Now, all the technology I mentioned till now focused on the removal of the particles from the air. What I want to use the next few minutes is to talk about the inactivation and the decontamination. And for that, one of the very common uh, technology would be to use UV radiation. Uh, mainly people are using low pressure mercury lamps that are emitting a 254 nanometer light that is known to damage DNA and RNA. Side comment, it can also result in much, uh, many uh, photochemical reactions for chemical pollutants. Many evidence on, on many evidence for the inactivation of various organisms, microorganisms by UV light. If we're using a closed system, there is no risk of exposure to the UV light, like in open systems. But there are also things that we need to consider as challenges with regard to this technology. First of all, the Decontamination depends on the dose, and the dose depends on the distance and the exposure time for the UV radiation. Many of the studies that we have available showing the effectiveness of this uh, technology were conducted at short distance between the uh, radiation and the microorganisms, and mainly on liquid via, uh, viral samples, not on airborne bioaerosols. For those, you have much less information. We well, also need left. to consider the formation of secondary uh, pollutants due to the fact that we have also chemicals that are going through photolysis. And if we are using mercury lamps without proper coating, we have emissions also at the 185 nanometers that will result in also ozone formation. I'm skipping the photocatalyst. I just want to jump here to mention about the VOCs degradation. Most of the technologies here are based on two oxidants, whether it's ozone or hydroxyl radicals. Ozone is known to be a, a, a effective disinfectant as well as reacting with unsaturated compounds. A, to mention here that the doses required for these uh, reactions are usually at much higher concentrations than the air quality standards. Uh, on which radicals react much faster than ozone and with a wider range 
uh, of organic compounds, not just unsaturated pollutants, but also saturated ones. You can see here, I'm not going to dive to the chemistry, but different uh, ways to generate actually OH radicals uh, using UV and vacuum UV radiation. We can also have biological oxidation. But the important message that I want to pass here is that it is not enough to look only on the degradation rate of the parent pollutant. We always need to consider what are the oxidation products. Are they less or more problematic than what we started with? So always look on the whole thing. And here again on this slide, I'm not going to dive into the details, but the important message is written here that in order to purify indoor air because of its complexity, we will probably need to combine various treatment methods in order to achieve that. And that can be ionization and filtration or filtration and photocatalysis, a biocide a doped filter, et cetera. So I don't have the time now to go into the details, but it's, we can't look only on one side. A general challenges for all air cleaning devices that we need to consider is that the effectiveness of these devices depends on multiple parameters. The technology, the design, the lo their location in the room, the environment that they are uh, uh, operating in, and their maintenance. Now, the data that is published or the tests that are done on these different devices is usually done in idealized control environments. So it's very likely that in real environment, they are not gonna perform as well as in the lab. It, there is no international test standard for a microbial inactivation and removal for this uh, instrument, okay? We have for particle removal for some countries, but not for bio uh, aerosols. And the regulatory process uh, that may apply to air cleaning devices is very complicated and overlaps. So in fact, you can find in the market instruments that are using exactly the same technology and one will, be form, will perform much better and much more safely than the other. So it's a very problematic market. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, air cleaning devices are not substituting a proper ventilation is just part of the strategies to reduce uh, indoor air uh, pollution. Proper cleaning will most likely require combination of various technologies. We need to ensure we do not replace biological health risk with chemical one. And this is very important now under the corona uh, crisis. And sometimes we will need to do the gain and benefit and uh, sorry and the risk and decide which one we are willing to pay the risk there more. A need to improve regulation regarding indoor air standards as well as air cleaning devices. And because reality is that the use of air cleaning devices is on the rise, it is important to support the industry as well as the customers to ensure that they are selecting and using the devices in the most safely and effective way. And that was a marathon to finish everything on time. <laughs> Thanks.